Goldwater said extremism in the defense of, you know, in the de defense of liberty is no vice, since I'm speaking to ASU, I might as well cite Barry Goldwater. <laughs> but, you know, and that's a tricky quotation. You know, that's, yeah, that's kind of in a, that would have, we'd have to parse, we'd have to take about 10 minutes more to parse that properly. But I would submit to you that in general, extremism in it, most of its permutations is ultimately the denial of empathy's importance for human flourishing. And it's, as such, it stands in direct opposition to liberal learning because part of what we're doing is teaching people to empathize. We're teaching people to step outside themselves and consider another viewpoint or another period in time where people might have been just like us and very human but thought about things differently. All of these things require empathy and extremism has no place uh, in liberal education. None of this obviously will be easy. It's gonna be tough, but universities owe it to themselves and their students to avoid taking the path of least resistance and instead do what is right, uh, both for the pursuit of truth and for the republic. So thank you for your attention. Threw a lot of stuff out there. I welcome your questions. <laughs> Having a discussion. Okay, why don't, we, uh, why don't we reassemble the panel up on the stools and uh, I want to pose one question to the panelists and then we'll open the floor uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, it's difficult to find just one question after all those great uh, <laughs> presentations. Let me, let me try it this way. Um, I will say that in the, in, across the whole year um, and certainly in the two-day conference that, that Laura Beth particularly um, mentioned, we, we, we did have more space for those who thought universities are distinct places and ought to rely on ideas of academic uh, freedom as academic professional judgment to restrict speech, closer to Laura Beth's uh, view. Uh, so uh, in the spirit of truth seeking, let me start with Laura Beth's general perspective and frame the question this way. Um, the hard case of, as Robbie mentioned, the provocateur mm -hmm. on a campus, a place uh, as all of you mentioned, devoted to truth-seeking, uh, higher order reasoning and debate and dialogue. Um, what should university leaders or faculty or students be thinking about this phenomenon, as Robbie mentioned it, of, of non-academic, <laughs> non-scholarly people um, wanting to use a university or a campus like it's a public park? Mm -hmm. um, so the Richard Spencer, the Milo Yulinopoulos, uh, other um, uh, people, just to have each of the four uh, panelists address that question. What, what should be done in that kind of, I'll pose it as a hard case. I know hard cases can make bad law, and, you know, but, but just to get out these uh, uh, sets of uh, questions, whatever order you, you want to address that. Um, I mean, this is an arbi ar argument largely put for the, the best defense of I've seen is from Robert Post, who's participated in a lot of yeah. this, that essentially um, you should have um, uh, academics deciding who actually f uh, forwards the academic mission of that. And I debated Stanley Fish on Friday, who's a dear friend of Robert Post, who basically agree on practically well, not, almost everything, not, not, not completely everything. So Robert Post was one of the keynote speakers oh, at right, our right. two-day panel, he so we heard, we heard from Robert. Yeah. Um, he, he writes a lot about academic freedom. He's the former uh, dean of Yale Law School. And I, it's funny to say that I just find it almost like funny because, it, because this is the exact same argument that was made during the sort of pushback from the free speech movement in the 1960s. It's not similar to, it's the same argument. And what people don't understand about the free speech movement of the 1960s is it wasn't a bunch of right wingers on the other side of the free speech movement. It was a bunch of people that thought the ivory tower should remain an ivory tower and we don't discuss politics here. Now, I understand that argument. I have some sympathy for it. Um, but it meant it was used to, you know, uh, Ab uh, Abby Hoffman should not be allowed to speak here. Uh, George Carlin should not be allowed to speak here. Uh, God forbid, Lenny Bruce should not be allowed to speak here. Um, so it's the resuscitation of a very old conservative argument. And if you look at the kind of people who get invited to campus, it is a weird mixture of provocateurs all over the spectrum. Um, I, I mean, really what we're talking about are two people, you know, Milo and, and, and Spencer. But if you look at um, some of the people who get invited, you have people who are, um, you know, pro, in some cases, you know, uh, pro Hamas. You have people who are invited who are just, you know, 
dirty comedians. You, you have people who are invited who are incredibly, uns uh, you have people like Bill Maher, who I actually respect, but at the same time, you know, is he the, the highest academic level? No, and nobody thinks twice about, about them being invited. So I do think that, uh, that, that the academy is complementing itself far too much to say, give us this power back and we'll be responsible with it. I, I, can, I, can, uh, I, I can guarantee what would happen is I'll, the people they agree with who might be incredibly rude still get invited. But the people they really disagree with, um, they're like, oh no, that's uncivil. I mean, that, that was um, John Stuart's Mill argument in 18, 1859. Do you want me to go? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it's idiotic to suppose <laughs> that uh, the only people who have something to contribute to the educational mission of a college or university are people who are qualified by the normal uh, credentialing uh, process uh, for tenure in one of the academic departments, a PhD or equivalent uh, degree in a particular field, uh, publications in peer-reviewed professional journals and, uh, and so forth. I don't even think that's worth discussing. Obviously, we have a lot to learn from people who uh, are thoughtful and have had interesting, important experiences in business, military, philanthropy, NGOs, fighting poverty. There are all sorts of people who have a place uh, and should be heard on university campuses, despite the fact that they couldn't be appointed uh, to, the, to the faculty. They're, they're, the reason they couldn't be appointed to the faculty is not because they're intellectual inferiors, believe me. It's that they've chosen a different path. They have something to say. Uh, they should be uh, heard. Uh, having said that, I'm, I'm just going to uh, actually borrow a point that, that Cornell West made at, uh, uh, when we were out in uh, Tempe, uh, speaking on behalf, uh, speaking under the auspices of the school, and that is all of us who have some or share in responsibility for choosing speakers to come to campus should exercise quality judgment. Yeah. You know, the, the, the reason that Richard Spencer shouldn't be invited is he doesn't have anything to say. There's nothing to contribute really to, right, okay? But there are lots of people on the right and in the left and not classifiable uh, who have something uh, important to say and they should, they, they, they should be heard. Uh, what I would really oppose is some sort of uh, standards for speakers that would function to exploit the overwhelming dominance of the left on campus to exclude conservatives being heard uh, in the only way they can be heard, that is to be brought in from the outside because we don't have them there. And Greg's right, I mean, we all know what would happen if, if this became a kind of, of permission for a lot of university faculties. Outsiders would be brought in Probably not very impressive quality controls would be exercised, but you would just be exposing your students to more of what they hear from the faculty anyway. You know who the losers are, by the way, on that? The losers are the students. Yeah, 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 yeah. Allison just whispered in my ear the students, and she's absolutely right. Which students? I'll submit to you it's not, it's all students, of course, but it's not primarily the conservative students. You know, they get challenged all the time. They're the beneficiaries, in a way, of the, of the uh, mismatched system. Those who have the gumption not to just fall into the group think. I mean, you, you go around to, wait, just, I'll just speak for my own place. I mean, the, the, I, I had faculty call, liberal fact, Paul Sigmund, the late Paul Sigmund, yeah. co a comment. To, he said, you know, the conservative students at Princeton just seem so sharp. And I said, Paul, well, you know, I have to, I mean, as much as I'd like to complain, you know, I, I, I'd like to claim conservatives are smart. It's not that. The, the, the level of intellectual ability is the same for our conservative students. It's very high, and it's the same for our conservative students as for our liberal students. But the conservative students seem so much sharper because they're constantly being challenged, having to defend themselves, having to think things through. No, the real losers are liberal students who go through four years, or students on the left, who go through four years never being challenged. What they hear in class, one thing. What they see on the reading lists, same thing. What they hear from the outside speakers who were brought in, same, same thing. Uh, so they have no idea that there is a credible alternative point of view or credible arguments for alternative uh, uh, points of view. And then they write off anything that deviates 
uh, from this hegemonic uh, orthodoxy as bigotry, mm -hmm. hatred, ignorance, foolishness, demagoguery, and so forth. Why don't we let Laura Beth uh, speak and then Allison. Well, I think by the time you get to the point where your college Republicans think they need to invite Milo Yiannopoulos, you've lost the game, right? Um, and so uh, I try to teach in exactly the way that you're describing. I think that there are a lot of things we need to be talking about using clickers in large classrooms so that people of different opinions can see that other people share their opinions before you start a conversation making the argument as best as you can on the other side and being honest about what your bias is so your students can interrogate it. Oh, there are things where you can take a poll anonymously and put it, it comes right up on your PowerPoint, how many people are pro-life in this room? And if you're teaching in a room of 120, there's gonna be 30 or 40% of people that are. And if you're going to lead a conversation, it helps the people feel free to speak up when they know that there are people all over the room that agree with them. It's working with your conservative students to, in your office hours to help them make the best argument and encouraging them to make it in the classroom if they feel comfortable. Helping them make the best argument you can if it's, con I think students need to, to know what the politics of their professors are and, um, and really do, do, we have to help them and guide them to the alternative point of view. I agree with um, everything that you say and I, I think the answers for students who feel excluded because of a political opinion are not, the things we need to do to, for inclusion are not dissimilar from what we need to do for our students who come from living in poverty, our first generation students, our racial minority students. Um, I, we've, we've got to work on it um, all the way around and advising the college Republicans so that they don't get to a point where they feel they have to invite Milo Yiannopoulos who isn't going to teach anything. Hey, let's get Alito. Let's get Clarence Thomas. Let's get Jeff Sessions, right? Let's invite, you could even say, although they get uninvited a lot, the Westboro Baptist, right? She argued one of the most significant recent First Amendment cases in constitutional history, she's legit, she won. So I think it's helping, uh, and I mean Margie Phelps by that, um, but I think it's helping the students understand that they don't, that there's, there are educational opportunities and we can foster their learning by bringing in people that actually have um, content. It doesn't mean that they have to be able to be appointed in a department, but I, but right. Okay, Allison. Yeah, just very quickly, I'd be, uh, to echo some things that have already been said and maybe embroider <laughs> on them a bit. Uh, I really do think that if you allow faculty and students to invite speakers to campus, you get rid of a lot of this problem, except in those rare instances where the Republican, college Republicans feel backed into a corner and they need to invite someone controversial. A lot of the big public university cases, for example, involve Richard Spencer just renting the space right. and showing up to cause trouble. I think it's fair to say, I don't know of a faculty member, I'm sure one exists because we're an odd bunch, but most, <laughs> most faculty members would never want to engage with Richard Spencer. There might be one out there who does, but I think this is this, this, just to emphasize one more point, uh, that I think the university is not a public park and this gets back to my point that I made in my formal remarks that this is really a debate we're having about the mission and purpose of higher education. Because if you think about the Yale example that you spoke about, the, 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 the yes means no, no means anal, that's yeah. a great example. You can go say that on a public park all you want. You can't say that on Yale's campus for reasons we may agree with or disagree with what the rationale was, but there is this discriminating role that universities play in deciding what's worth engaging. Okay, um, I ask that uh, we comply with the two principles behind brief questions from the audience. First, that it be brief, and second, it be a question, <laughs> not a, a statement. There's a microphone coming around. Just briefly identify who you are and then pose a brief question to the panel. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Paul, thanks for, thanks for doing this. Michael Maybach, and thank you very much. Ms. Sanger, I'd like to ask you a question, Al Allison. Um, so if there was a parent here today thinking about sending their child to college and they'd say, you know, I, I read that 80 to 90% of the Harvard or University of Maryland faculty voted for President Obama and President Clinton. Mm -hmm. 
I think your message was, we just want them to be intellectually sort of more rigorous, and yet faculty decide tenure, mm -hmm. and therefore we, ha and then have life tenure, if you will, just about. So we have sort of a continuous loop of people selecting their colleagues. How do you break out of that to have true intellectual diversity? Uh, yeah. I think it's a really great question. I think out in the general public there are some misunderstandings about how some faculty hiring takes place. I can only speak about what I know about Middlebury College and what I know from friends at Princeton. Maybe you would disagree. Maybe this is a great place to have this discussion. <laughs> I think in Middlebury we're deciding who's the smartest, who has the best arguments. We don't care what the content of the arguments are. We're looking for the quality of mind because that's going to sustain them over the long haul. There are some people I would uh, you know, acknowledge are looking for particular methodologies. There's a tendency for faculty want to hire the person who's going to help them with their research, <laughs> which is really annoying you know, because it has nothing to do with educating students. That exists, but for the most part, we, we have a quite diverse faculty at, uh, at Middlebury, and that's part of the reason why our department chair, without so much as thinking about it, agreed to co-sponsor the event with Charles Murray, and then got his head taken off. Alex is here. You can, we have, we have one of my former students in the audience. Did so. he then apologize, though? What's that? Didn't he then apologize? Yeah, this was a problematic thing. My chair did let me very, down uh, in that 60s. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, you don't know what the pressure was like, right? You had to be really strong. You, to you don't to that. yield. You don't, yield, yeah, like, yeah. Like uh, you know, I was I was not happy with him. Yeah. But he was on the right side. We had this heated debate. It turns out there were two or three people that thought Charles Murray shouldn't be invited to campus, but the endorsement stood, mm -hmm. and that drove other people crazy because it's they saw that as that co-sponsorship was an endorsement. It was an imprimatur on the quality of the views, which it isn't at all. It's just saying this is someone worth engaging. So how we how we address the problem you've identified, I think we've just got to all be more self-conscious about our t capacity to choose like-minded people or people who remind of us, us of ourselves. If we all did a little better job, and this is just not in the academy, but in the world at large, of thinking about, hey, it might be nice to have diverse viewpoints in the room rather than hiring that person that's just like me because they'd be fun to go have a beer with afterwards. I think you'll get better, better uh, outputs across the board. Robbie, you have a brief? Yeah, yeah I, I want to yeah. say a word about, uh, about that. Um, I'll, I'll repeat something that I said at the um, workshop at Princeton that yeah. uh, Allison graced us with uh, her attendance at. Um, uh, I'm opposed, as Allison is, to quotas for conservatives or an affirmative action program for conservatives. This has been suggested in, in a serious way by serious people. Mm -hmm. uh, the self-identified leftist uh, president of, middle, of uh, uh, Wesleyan. Wesleyan University, <laughs> I've forgotten his name, is it Roth. Newman? Michael Roth. Michael Roth. <laughs> uh, uh, suggest, suggested uh, it in an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. I, I don't just wave it away out of hand. Uh, you know, maybe it's going to come to that, but I'm, I'm not there, certainly. What I want to say is stop discriminating against us. We don't yeah. need quotas. We don't need to just stop discriminating against us. Now, I've already revealed by saying that that I think there is discrimination. Let me say then, in addition, that while some of that discrimination is self-conscious, people are aware that they're discriminating, they're doing it deliberately, that's not the main problem by any means. That's a relatively small number of people. Most people who are guilty of the kind of discrimination that results in the gross underrepresentation of conservatives in the academy could pass a lie detector test <laughs> they could swear on the origin of species or whatever their sacred text is <laughs> that they are not discriminating. Uh, and that's not a left problem. I, I have disagreement with our pal Alan Kors. I rarely disagree with Alan, uh -huh. but on this we do. He thinks that's a left problem. Uh -huh. That's a problem with, with, with left ideology. Oh, I, yeah, I think, he and I had a debate a few years ago on NPR about this actually. Oh. Um, uh, no, I think it's a human nature problem. Oh, I'm, an, I'm an Augustinian. You know, <laughs> it's very, we fallen, frail, fallible creatures mm -hmm. who, who fall in love with our beliefs and our ideas and wrap our emotions tightly around our convictions and all that stuff. It, you know, we have a lot of trouble acknowledging that work that comes to conclusions that fly in the face of stuff we really, really deeply <laughs> believe and are committed to could be good work. You know, when I, when, I, when I read some of the conclusions that my colleague Peter Singer reaches about 
the morality of killing newborn infants, not just, not just unborn children, newborn infants, stuff like that. I mean, I think, whoa, this is horrible, this is crazy. And I really do believe this is horrible, this is crazy. And though, but I read his arguments and I say, no, this is challenging. It's my, the onus is on me to answer these arguments because these are serious. This is not ranting, this is not Richard Spencer, Th this is not hatred. Uh, I, I think he's way off here, but he's made serious arguments that deserve to be addressed and the onus is on me to address them. My arguments, my pro-life arguments, for example, are much better. Whether, whether they're, you think they're successful or not, I can tell you they're much better than they would be were it not for my engagement with Peter Singer and others who represent views uh, uh, like his. So I, I again agree with Allison that what we need to promote from the administ top administrative level all the way down is a kind of self-awareness that we have a problem. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge that you have a problem. The discrimination figures in it, and we've got to resolve to go the extra mile to make sure that we're not guilty of that, that we are prepared to uh, vote for hiring or promoting people who really do challenge our fundamental beliefs. If we've gone through an academic career or a big chunk of an academic career and never actually voted for somebody that we radically disagree with in a, in a hiring or promotion situation or a tenure, tenure case, we've got a problem. Yeah. Just briefly, Greg. Oh, it's it, it really super quick. Um, one of the things that happened after Milo is it's become kind of common wisdom that essentially, you know, uh, he's the one person everyone should agree that no one should invite. I wouldn't have invited him myself, but there's two, two important things. He spoke successfully on campuses all around the country prior to um, the, the, the riots in Berkeley, um, sometimes even without any meaningful incident. So, uh, so that brings me to my major point. Um, we can't, we have to have really high tolerance for difference of opinion. We should have absolutely no tolerance for violence. And that's something that we, we can't just let the students who engage in that just off the hook. And I think that's a major mistake that Berkeley made. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna preemptively introduce our next uh, questioner, is Ambassador Ken Edelman. And I wanna mention that he's coming to Arizona State University in, as part of a summer leadership seminar on Shakespeare and character and leadership, he, he and his thank wife, uh, Carol But Thank you all, this has been a wonderful discussion. And I say that as somebody who got uh, shouted down at my alma mater, Grinnell College, very oh, left wow. place. But anyway, uh, my question is, um, isn't there a dynamic going on that the student groups wanna have a sensational speaker mm -hmm. because they wanna have everybody know that they're on campus. And most people don't even know they're on campus. And so they want a sensational speaker. And then the university has to pay for that speaker. And so is there an obligation by the university to say, no, we're not gonna pay for that? Is there, you know, I understand there's a obligation for the students to have somebody responsible, as right. the panel members have said, uh, which is all fine, but if you're looking for uh, headlines, if you're looking to let your group be known on campus, you don't want somebody moderate. Yeah. For, for public campuses, actually, there's a specific law on this. There's a case called Southworth that's exactly about uh, these kind of issues. And what the Supreme Court found, at a public college at least, if you take student fees and then use them to invite speakers, and most, stu most speakers are invited to public campuses using the student fees, you can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. This is absolutely well settled law. So that, that's basically if you're saying, wait, you can invite Walter Conkright, but I can't invite Tucker Carlson. You know, like um, that would be something that you'd be on the losing end of a case. And a lot of these principles that even though private colleges aren't necessarily bound, sorry, outside of the state of California where they are by a Supreme Court precedent because they're not bound by the First Amendment, uh, private universities tend to follow similar, uh, similar rules because they just think they're good practice. I, I, can, uh, I can tell you that at Princeton, where we do have a larger than usual number of out of the closet uh, uh, conservative faculty, as I said, uh, conservative students are not clamoring to hear even Milo Yiannopoulos or uh, much less uh, Richard Spencer. They, they're very interested in hearing Harvey Mansfield, Marianne Glendon, Adrian Vermeule, Candace Vogler. But when I go around, uh, and Cornell and I go around uh, speaking about this issue to campuses around the country, recently at Bucknell and Villanova, I will sometimes ask students, not, not just the conservatives, and just ask the students generally, have, uh, how, how many of you would like to hear from Mary Ann Glendon? How many of you would like to hear from Leon Cass? Mm -hmm. Nobody's heard of them. Yeah. Now why at Bucknell or Villanova or any of dozens of other places I could mention 
have the students not heard of Leon Cass or Marianne Glendon? I think it has something to do with what they're hearing in the classroom and in the ambient culture from people for whom Leon Cass and Marianne Glendon and Harvey Mansfield and Candace Vogler are not considered the kinds of people who are worth hearing. I think this is a really great question because the, the question becomes, you know, at what expense? The Berkeley situation was obviously very, very expensive. I've heard everything from one and a half million to three million dollars. Um, and I don't think the First Amendment requires the university to go bankrupt. And then the question gets into, and this becomes literally the question, can, will you be insured? And as I said, in Arizona, I don't think we want insurance adjusters deciding who gets to speak on our campuses and not. Absolutely anyone engaged in violence or destroying property should be arrested and everyone, people who are, um, people should be safe to protest and counter protest these speakers. Um, so we have to keep students stay safe. We don't often know the expenses, and I think, and, and then they blow up, and then they become a reason for people not to support higher education and say, I'm not going to send my student, my kid there or there. And higher education gets a bad rap. It's easily cut when, um, when states need to cut budgets, and this is one of the reasons. So I think we all have an interest in maintaining the university um, means figuring out ways to manage these problems. But that's not really a good solution, but it, it does mean thinking about all of the people who are involved in making these decisions. I think it's very helpful for, pe for people to um, think about the problem, what I would agree is the crisis, uh, in terms of the Overton window. Do people know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Overton window? So this is the idea of the window of discourse that is considered acceptable and permissible and worthy discourse. The Overton window closes get, you know, down further and further and further as subjects, lines of argument, ways of approaching questions are ruled out of bounds, not acceptable, written out of the script because they represent uh, incorrect thinking. Uh, maybe because it's regarded as bigoted or regarded as dismissed as hatred or, or what have, whatever. Now, nobody that I know of thinks that there aren't some limits, but the Overton window needs to be very, very widely open for a university really to function as a university, to, to pursue its truth-seeking mission. And I don't think that there's any doubt that on campus after campus after campus around the country, that window is much too close to being closed. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it's, it's terrific to, to have a group left and right talk about the needs for diverse points of view to be presented and to make the effort to present it in your own classrooms. Uh, and I take it for granted, even though none of you have said this, that you're in grading a student, it would, the grade would be based on the quality of their presentation and not on whether or not you happen to agree with, mm -hmm. with the result mm -hmm. that they came to. Uh, but we hear a lot about students, and this comes up in the context of discussions on campuses of, of Israel, Palestine, that students who have the quote unquote wrong point of view uh, feel very much that their grades are at stake if they come out with the wrong perspective, uh, not to mention faculty who we hear of who you know, stay in the closet, as it were, because they feel their careers will be impacted if they have the wrong point of view. Uh, w and I, this may just fall within this crisis in higher education, but my question is, uh, how, do, how do we deal with this? What has to be done to assure that students of whatever point of view in Middle East studies programs and elsewhere are, are able to uh, represent who they are and express their perspective and, and have it respected uh, as long as, of course, it is based on sound, sound argument. Allison? Yeah. Just very quickly, even in a place like Middlebury, um, there's just wonderful teaching going on. There are a lot of people like me where we have a free exchange of views in our classroom, and you're graded on the basis of the strength of your argument and the evidence you muster to support it, not the conclusion you reach. Uh, and I think it's very easy to navigate away from the professors whose classrooms might be different. So. Um, yeah, if you, have a, yeah. if you have a daughter or son, just have them talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, once again, I think that the first thing that you need to do if you're going to address the problem is recognize that you have a problem. Yeah. 
and very few academics want to recognize that we do have a problem. Now, it's also true that sometimes, especially non-academics, exaggerate the problem. And, and they think that uh, you know, some massive number of professors is giving students bad grades because they disagree. Or in some particular fields like M Middle Eastern uh, studies or Near Eastern studies, uh, that's happening. It's not massive numbers, but it is happening. And it's happening enough to be significant and something to worry about. So I think that we need to face up to the fact that we have a problem. Now, I, uh, last uh, uh, May, uh, alienated a whole room full of uh, Princeton uh, parents uh, who uh, had assembled for a discussion of these issues. That's, that's parents of kids who are currently at uh, Princeton. Uh, when I responded uh, to a uh, mother, a woman, who had a kid at Princeton, uh, whose son uh, told her that he had run into this particular uh, problem with a particular uh, professor. And uh, uh, she says that she advised him simply to write what the professor wanted to hear because that's a small price to pay and it would be terrible to put at risk your grade point average when you're wanting to go to medical school, as this young man evidently was. Uh, I said she gave him the wrong advice, mm -hmm. that this was, you know, penny wise and pound foolish, you know, maybe it's going to help the kid get into medical school. I doubt that, that you know, a, a B minus rather than a B plus or even a B minus rather than an A minus is going to make all that much difference in the end. But even if it does, your kid's soul is at stake, your kid's integrity. Don't tell your kid to say stuff, even on exams, that don't represent his true beliefs. There's something fundamentally dishonest and corrupting about that. All, as far as I can tell, and maybe there were some who agreed with me or were afraid to speak up, as far as I can tell, it became a big issue. All of the parents in the room disagreed with me and agreed with the mother. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I, I'm, I'm beginning to kind of wonder, you know, what's with the parents? It's the same reaction I, I get when I hear about this Yale chant. I'm thinking, do these boys not have parents? Who raised them? Were they raised by wolves? Yeah. Who's, you know, they don't have a mother? I mean, if I were, if, you know, the last thing I'd have to worry about if, if it became known that I had participated in a chant like that was the university <laughs> taking care of it. If you know my mother, you know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Any last comments from? I, I, I don't get tests where people's opinions are, are the source of the grade, right? I mean, you've got to cover the material. You better know what the means of production are, and you better know what the iron cage of bureaucracy is. And um, I, I think there are ways to, com you know, if you are in a political theory or a jurisprudence or, or you're doing a unit on that, you, you do have to be careful. And I think, you know, there are, again, practical things you can do. I tend to, um, take some of the best answers in the class and I reserve them back. And when people come and say, you know, I don't like my grade, I say, hey, let's look at the best answer. Regardless of what the answer is, let's look at the paragraph structure. Let's look at the way that they supported their argument with evidence. And now let's look at yours and so and, and help you write better. Um, but that's just educational malpractice and it should not be tolerated.